<clears throat> What's good, family? What's good? Hey, y'all, you can see me, right? Yes, sir. You. What's good, family? This is your boy, Sol Amon of ITBM2, the official channel. And today, we're going to have a very, very, very special debate between the Gorilla Hebrew and the Iman Bashir. And um, I just set the premise for them. Hold on a second. Yeah, I knew that was going on with the John. All right. One second. One second. All right. Peace, peace. What's going on, Wax Dog? We have a very, very special debate today between the Gorilla Hebrew and the Imam Bashir. And I'm trying to get my screen right. Trying to get the screen right. Um, and uh, just to go and set the uh, the premise right from the outset, um, it's going to be a five minute intro. You got a fit. You got a fifteen minute premise. A ten minute second round premise, and then you have a five minute closing, and then after that, we're going to have a ten minute lightning round, which usually goes over ten minutes, by the way. So, you know, we just want to put it on paper for 10 minutes. Now, the title of this discussion is Did Jesus Die on the Cross? Um, and very interesting topic. I actually debated. No, I didn't debate this topic with the Gorilla Hebrew. We debated the second topic that they're going to have in the trilogy. We debated that topic. So um, definitely should be a very interesting discussion. Without further ado. We're going to hand it over to the Gorilla Hebrew, and we're going to give him five minutes for his opening. Um, what's going on, Gorilla Hebrew? Hey, peace, peace, man. How y'all living? Hey, man, we living pretty good, man. Oh, um, oh, go ahead. You can do your five-minute opening, bro. Your five minutes right, starts bet. now. Bet. All right, so first and foremost, of course, I got to give all praises, honor, and glory unto the Most High God, Yahweh, and we do so. Uh, you muted, you just, we can't hear you. Uh, we're in Hebrew. What you? Allah shut them off. <laughs> Allah shut the light off, man. Like he froze. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Uh, let me let me text you. Solar vision in the building. Make sure y'all hitting that like. Make sure you got your Bibles ready. Make sure your Bibles are in hand. If you hear with us now. Pull it up on your phone, hey, pull it up on your tablet. I told you what the cost of admission was, man. When you come in, that was the cost of admission. Hit the like button, yo. And why y'all playing with me? Stop playing with me, yo. Hit the, hit the like, like button, button, family. Hit the like button, man. That's all you gotta do, hit the like button. But um, yo, like hold on a second. Cause I be I was trying to share my joint so y'all could uh so y'all could see. But while you do that, Solar, let me get these people prepared. Hit that like button, the Solar Vision. You know, Yo. um, he bring in the powerful, powerful information. This is really the um, the debate corner, you know, where information is going to be coming at you from here on out like crazy. You know, tell your friends, tell your family. We set in a new precedence when it comes to bringing information. Um, whether you're religious, whether you're not religious, whether it's African spirituality, 
whatever the case may be, it's going to be right here, dealt with in real time. And um, make sure you support the channel. You know, you can, you can hit me up on Facebook, Brother Bashir, Bashir Abdul Haq. You know, um, hit me up, come see me. Uh, my channel also will be up in, in effect in, you know, not too long from now. So you can get these exquisite teachings. Um, and so, yeah, you know, make sure y'all hitting that like once again, get your Bibles ready because we're going to look at the scripture for what it is and it's going to change some things. So we're waiting for uh, Brother Gorilla Hebrew to come back in the building, um, you know, and uh, yeah. I can't wait. This is going to be interesting. Very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, let me stop here. So. Yeah. So, you know, uh, definitely, man, definitely should be a very interesting topic. I mean, a very interesting dialogue. We're going to be waiting for the Gorilla Hebrew to come back in, seeing what's good with him. I think he has some type of technical difficulty. And uh, we're going to see, uh, I'm going to give him a call real quick and see where he's at. Now, anybody who wants to step out there, because I see like um, a couple people making comments on my promotional video. And if you want to step out there, feel free to reach me at solar, solarmind123 at gmail.com. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened? Yeah, yeah. You cut off. I, I sent you. I sent you the text that you froze. Yeah, yeah. Your jaw froze up. No, it froze right when you before you even said anything. Yeah, I sent you a text that you froze. Yo, he was dropping science too. <laughs> Yo, we got about 30 people up in here, so you know. Um, okay, you're back in the building. Okay. All right, all right, yeah, my bad, my bad. I, ain't, I have no clue. I got to face me. All right, cool. All right, no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> all right, uh, let me start back on my point. Um, Just start from the top, bro. <laughs> from the top, like it, it cut off like right before I said anything. Hey, you you ain't even say nothing yet. It just froze. <laughs> And this stuff is bugging, my fault. So yeah, all right, uh, my apologies. So first and foremost, of course, I got to give all praise and honor and glory unto the Most High God, Yahweh. And I do so in the name of His only begotten Son, who the world calls Jesus Christ, real name in the Paleo Hebrew, Yahweh Shai. And he's he's going to be the, the topic of, of today's debate. Um, you have uh, a perception of what took place in the crucifixion. Uh, of who the world calls Christ by Muslims. Um, they don't all agree on this perception. Um, the brother Imam Bashir has an interesting perspective on this, but what we have to understand is what Muslims and believers in the Bible, followers of the Quran of Mecca and followers of the Bible should all put preeminence on the prophets. Even when you look at the Quran and their understanding of, of Muhammad and what his duty and job was, uh, it's to be a prophet. So there's emphasis put on the prophets throughout the Bible and throughout the Quran, right? So in understanding that, we have to go to the prophets because the prophets have the divine revelation of the creator and they foretold of future events, right? So I'm gonna go to an example of that in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. And I'm gonna start here at the third verse because this is a what they would call a messianic prophecy, a prophecy foretelling of who the world calls Christ Yahweh Shah, right? Starting at verse 3 here in Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of uh he, he is despised, he is selected, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and rejected. Why? Because he appeared to his people, and as we know, his people in large part rejected him, right? Uh and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteem him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Where did he bear our griefs? On the cross. And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That was all on the cross, that he was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. So those wounds that he took on that cross were all for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So it was very key that he suffered these stripes for the purpose of the healing of the nation of Israel, whom we are. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. So verse 6 is very important. Because when we look in the scriptures, it talks about the sheep going after their own ways, not having a shepherd. The sheep is in reference to Israel, who we are. And when we go our own ways and we don't have a shepherd, what we're doing is committing iniquity. In large part, it's connected to idolatry and various other transgressions against God. So the purpose of Christ getting on the cross was to reconcile us to our creator through him bearing our iniquities. And it's all pursuant to prophecy. So to deny that is to deny prophecy and it's a blasphemy. Right? Uh, continuing on verse 6. Or oh, that's what I just read. So like in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And, a, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. That's a Hebrew idiom. To be cut off out of the land of the living means to be killed. So we're clearly seeing the prophecy is specifying that the man had to die. That's the word of God. That doesn't come back void. That cannot be denied, right? Uh, he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. He made his grave with the wicked. Who makes their grave? People who are dead. So he had to have died. And with the rich in his death, it tells us right there, plain and simple. If it wasn't plain enough that he was cut off from the land of the living. If it wasn't plain enough that he was put in a grave. It says verbatim right here. Uh, and with the rich in his death, he died. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he was a sin offering. How do you, you how you made a sin offering without death, without that blood? That's all what's called mandatory to make atonement for sins, right? Uh, so like, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall, uh, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Right, meaning the Most High God was pleased on him getting crucified. Uh, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He's justifying us as a nation through bearing our iniquities through the crucifixion. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. This is in accordance to even what Muslims believe that Christ is going to come back at the end time. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. There we go again. A fourth time is emphasizing. You said what? One minute left. Again, yeah. it's, it's emphasizing that he had to die. And he was numbered with the transgressors and bear the sin of many and make intercession for our for the transgressors, right? So with that, I'm gonna close and give all praise to Yahweh Shem Yahushua. Looking forward to the rest of the debate. Okay, okay, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. With that, we're gonna turn over to the baby face Imam Bashir in the building. We want to set the timer for five minutes. Let me reset this timer. Your five minutes starts now. Peace, family. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallahu wa ahduhu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasulu amma ba'du fa'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. He is alone and has no partner. I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his servant and message messenger i seek refuge with allah from the accursed satan and we begin in the name of allah family i'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight and i want to stress the importance of understanding this conversation tonight so if you can have your bibles on hand that would be great you know during the introduction of our beloved brother of guerrilla hebrew as well as our christian listeners they want us to believe that a man was sacrificed and he died for the atonement or died for the sins of the people. However, the very book that they read has been tampered with, not only has it been tampered with, 
but an ideology, um, uh, uh, ideology has been placed in the minds of the people that actually go against the scripture themselves. So we're going to analyze very closely the scriptures. We're going to analyze very closely the words of Jesus himself, as well as the words as other witnesses or so-called witnesses that was around during this um, crucifixion. So in order for us to really understand and get the true context of did Jesus die? Was it a crucifixion or crucifixion? As in F-I-C-T-I-O-N, not real, did not happen. And I certainly want to prove that today. I'm not, I don't want to make this um, proof um, evident to shame or to disgrace any of the messengers or any of the prophets or especially um, who we call Isa or some may call Yahweh Shah, um, which is Jesus, may peace be upon him, who was a great prophet and messenger of the creator. What I want to shed light on is that the scripture itself, we have been fooled. As Malcolm says, we have been hoodwinked. We have been bamboozled, run amok. We have been lied to, tricked, and fooled into a Roman Catholicism uh, vantage point of the realities or the false realities of Jesus dying for your sins. I'm going to show you through the scripture itself, and you have to follow the story, and you're going to have to follow it attentively, and I will be giving you all of the verses that you can analyze, and when we start really getting into this thing, listen to both sides attentively. Listen to who is speaking, who is giving the narrative versus the individual that was there, which was Jesus himself, Isa alayhi salam, um, Yahawashah, etc. Listen to those words. If you know um, in the King James Version, which is the version that we're, we're going to be using here, um, there's red letters for the words that Jesus himself spoke. And so firsthand source is very important to understanding this whole thing. And you will see by the end of this discussion that Jesus most certainly did not die on the cross, but rather he lived and he was not buried in a grave as in a dirt, as in a, in a casket. He was in, in place in a tomb, which is a practice that we can historically see that they um, use tombs in Palestine, in Israel, and um, through, throughout their parts of the world, they use tombs to lay people inside. So they did not put them in the ground. But I want you to understand that the scripture itself, uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 says, and if, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. I would say that I kind of agree with this verse in the sense that um, all of the lessons will not be in vain, but the teaching about this man being crucified and dying for your sins, that talk would be in vain. If we analyze the Bible, um, if we really do a, a critical analysis on the Bible, we can see that the, the books of the Bible varies from producer to producer, meaning that the Roman Catholicism or Roman Catholic Church has a Bible that has 73 books in it. The King James Version, and the key word here is version, meaning their perspective on the story is only a perspective of the story. But as we, but in that King James Version, may I add that it has 66 books. So there are seven books or chapters, books with chapters that are missing. So there's a discrepancy there. And so because of this, I'm going to be able to show you that through the grace of Allah, the Almighty, and through the promised Messiah and Mahdi, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, alayhi salam, who we do believe is the metaphorical um, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, coming, of, coming of um, Isa, alayhi salam. And um, we want you just to listen attentively, get this information, because it is going to be sublime, divine, and right on time. Jesus did not die on the cross for your sins, and it's time for you to move on to a loss of power to Allah and stop worshiping man, which is only the servant and the messenger. May Allah be with us all. May the Creator be with us all, who holds many names. All names that represent the Most High are correct on this day, and we're going to be the true Bible keep, uh, keepers and the true teachers 
of the truth about Isa or Jesus alayhi salam. May peace be upon him. All right, family. Um, we're gonna get into the first, the first premise round. That'll be a fifteen-minute round right there, and uh, we're gonna turn it over to the Gorilla Hebrew. You there, Gorilla Hebrew? Yes, sir. All right. Um, is is the balls in your court? If you haven't done so, hit that like button. Make sure you hit that like button. That's the cost of admission. That like button. So That's right. if you come in the building, hit that like button. Um. So let me set the timer. Uh, we can't see you, Gorilla. Y'all can't see me? No, you got the, um, unless you, unless you want it that way. No, 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 hell no. Hold on. I don't know what's going on. Oh, oh, my fault. Just, just, uh, you see me now? Hold on a second. Oh, you can see my table now, right? I'm, yeah, we can see your table uh, now. Yeah, just let me know if that happens again. My fault. I'm, I'm running blind. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. Um, let me set the timer. And, uh, your 15 minutes starts now. All right. Again, I give all praise to Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai. Um, I want to lay the premise for, especially my Israelite audience or people who aren't familiar with the Muslim perspective on the crucifixion. Um, uh, so I'm gonna start here. Why don't Muslims or why do Muslims reject the crucifixion? Right. This is Surah 4 and 157. I'm gonna first read the, uh, I believe it's the Sahih International Translation. And for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Uh, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who defer over it are in doubt about it. So this uh, verse in the, in the, uh, the, the Quran is why many Muslims um, reject the concept of the crucifixion. Some believe that there was a switcheroo. Some believe Judas actually was made to look like Jesus and actually went on the cross and died. Uh, I don't believe that my brother Imam Bashir is of that school of thought. There's another school of thought as well. I'm going to read another translation of the uh, Quran, that same verse. It said, and because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger. They slew him, uh, but they slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them, right? So this one says it appeared so much to them. The other one says that literally somebody else was in his stead and took the crucifixion. So we have kind of two different schools of thoughts that I'm familiar with amongst the Muslims. Some believe there was a switcheroo and some believe that he went through the crucifixion, but he did not die in the crucifixion. All right. So even let's just take a look at one more. This is the Yusuf Ali uh, translation. Uh, uh, that they uh, that they said in boast, we have killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them, right? So it says this in, in various other translations as well, and y'all can check them out. You know, I don't have a whole lot of time, so I don't want to read every single one. And then uh, verse 158 of that same surah says, God raised him up to himself. God is mighty and wise, right? So this is what I believe the Quran is alluding, alluding to, and I believe that modern Muslims have kind of misunderstood this. I'm not even going to say in this instance the Quran is totally wrong. What I'm going to say is Muslims are misinterpreting what their own book is saying and teaching about it. And I'm going to reference Bible scriptures, red letter Bible verses, as this brother put a, a major emphasis on the red letter, meaning the words of Christ are in red letter. And those are important. It's important to understand and emphasize the red letter. So we're going to take a look at the red letter. And we're going to take a look at what Christ says. And this is what I believe the Quran is alluding to. And this is what I believe that if the Muslims understood it, they would have a better understanding of the crucifixion. This is John the 10th chapter in the 17th verse. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. So what is Jesus the Christ saying in this instance? The father loves me because I am laying down my life down that's death that's the crucifixion verse 18 no man taketh it from me but i lay it down myself so when it's saying in the quran that they didn't kill christ nor did they crucify him but it was made to appear they thought in their minds that they crucified christ but in fact christ said didn't no one take this from me i laid my life down 
This is what I believe the Quran is alluding to. And this, and this is what I believe is what's going on here. Christ made the choice to do what he did. And, and nobody had the power to truly take that from him or kill them themselves. So they tried to kill him multiple times throughout the Gospels, and it was never successful. But all things had to happen according to the prophecy. Again, prophecy is of preeminent importance. Why? Because both the Bible and the Quran emphasize the importance of the words of the prophets, the messengers of the Most High God, right? So again, uh, John 10 and 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. So him having the power to lay his life down was given to him by the most high and could not be taken from him or could not be overpowered by any man on the earth. That's why, again, the Quran says this. But it, uh, they neither. Uh, but they killed him not nor crucified him. But it was so made to appear to them. So they thought it in their minds. But in actuality, what happened is. Christ laid down his life pursuant to prophecy and the power allotted to him by the Father. I'm going to go to another verse here in the gospel. This is Matthew 26 and 53 to 54. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? This is when he's getting carted away to the crucifixion. And Peter takes his sword and cuts off the ear of the Roman centurion that's trying to captive, take him captive. And he stopped him and he said, don't you know I can pray to the most high God and he will send war angels here and he'll kill everybody. But I'm going through this and I have to do this because I have to lay my life down. Right. Uh, verse 54. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that uh, that uh, that thus it must be? One second. So as Yahweh Shai, the world calls Christ is emphasizing how can the scriptures be fulfilled? He had to go through the crucifixion and he had to die. Again, going back right here to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. And also go to the ninth verse. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit found in his mouth. See, when we go here, this is what has to be fulfilled. This is what he's referencing. This is what he's trying to elaborate to his beloved disciple, Peter. Brother. No, you can't do that. I have to go through this crucifixion. I have to die. Why do I have to die? Because the prophets of old said that my death and resurrection would come. So there's no way to get around this because, again, prophecy takes preeminence. It takes preeminence in the Quran and it takes preeminence in the Bible. There's no disputation on this. I'm going to continue on. Though. Let's go to the book of Titus uh, 2 and 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So he gave himself up. How did he give himself up? Through dying, through, through laying his life down. And then he taught us in the Gospels, there is no greater love than a man lay his life down for his friends. And he gave us a perfect example by laying his life down. Why would he say these things? Why would the scriptures say these things? Why would the prophecy say these things if they, in fact, did not occur? This is a total denial of prophecy. That's why it's a blasphemy, because this is the word of God. Again, the Quran says it and the Bible says it. So if it's the word of God, how then can we say that it did not come true? How can we say that the words of the creator, the almighty, the supreme being came back forth? That's blasphemy, right? Continuing on, right? We're going to go read Isaiah 53 again, and I'm going to just read six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, Yahweh, have laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, that iniquity was there. For, for the brother Imam Bashir and many of his Muslim cohorts to criticize the idea that a man will be lifted up for a sin offering. This is all going back to the prophet. Again, that your scripture emphasizes. I'm going to skip to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord Yahweh to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Exactly what Muslims are criticizing is exactly what the prophets say would occur, that his offering will be given for sin, that his soul rather will be given as an offering for sin. We can't deny the prophets, right? Uh, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord Yahweh shall prosper in his hand, right? In addition to the various scriptural examples and references and witnesses that we can show to the attestation of the crucifixion, the death of Christ, we have historical ones as well. I'm going to pull one. This is out of the Josephus of um, Antiquities, 18, chapter 3. It says, Josephus mentions the crucifixion of Jesus in passing. 
the passage is judged authentic by most scholars. Once the obvious Christian additions marked here in brackets and italics are removed, now there was just about this time Jesus a wise man, for he was a doer of wondrous works, a teacher. He drew over to him both of the Jews and many Gentiles. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, thus that love of those that loved him uh, at first did not forsake him, um, and the tribe of the Christians so named from him are now uh, are not extinct at this day. So the crucifixion is even something that's historically recognized that he went and would die on that cross. I have a couple more here. Uh, scholars generally consider Tacticus's reference to the execution of Jesus by Pontius Pilate to be both authentic and of historical value as an independent Roman source. And that's via a, a book called Jesus and His Contemporaries, a comparative study by Craig A. Evans. And I have another one here. Uh, Paul Eddy and George Boyd state that this is now firmly established that Tacticus provides a non-Christian confirmation of the crucifixion of Jesus. And that's via a book called The Jesus Legend, A Case of Historical Reliability of, of the Synoptic Jesus Tradition. So when you deal with uh, uh, jo Josephus attesting to his crucifixion and Tacticus, which y'all can look up Tacticus and what he says about Pontius Pilate crucifying him, and then all the various uh, excavations and historical research that's been done to verify the authenticity of both attestations, we clearly not only see scripturally, but we see in secular history that the, Christ, that the crucifixion of Christ was a historical event that occurred. One second. I now have a quote that I want to read um, from a Muslim website, and um, the only reason I'm going to read this quote is for the purpose of understanding that there is a conceptual disconnect between um, what you would call Hebrews, Hebrew thought, Hebraic thought, and, and Muslim thought when it comes to sacrifice, all right? So there's a conceptual disconnect, so I want to read this to speak to the position that Muslims have on sacrifice. Um, the notion of uh, vicarious atonement for sins, absolving one's sins through the blood of another, is nowhere to be found in Quran. Right? So we see that this is not a Quranic principle. So we see why those who are adherents to the Quran are so um, vehemently against the crucifixion of Christ and that whole concept. When we go in the Bible, we see blood uh, uh, used as an atonement for sins, sacrifice of animals and human beings all over as a, a, a continual theme throughout the scriptures. But we don't see that in Quran. So this there, then this what? It drives the school of thought of Muslims to be against and adverse to that concept. So that's where a conceptual disconnect comes in to see why they're so against it, right? So I'm going to go to a few scriptures here in the Bible in regards to sacrifice and its importance uh, that the Creator gave us. Exodus 19 and 6. And he shall and, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So we see the children of Israel are made a kingdom of priests. Muslims are not made a kingdom of priests. There's not a, a Islamic priesthood as far as Muslims are concerned. So with that being said, with the absence of that, this is why we see a disconnect and not an emphasis put on sacrifice because that is a priestly duty. That, that comes with ordinances and, and things of that that's found all over the Torah, as well as the Melchizedek priesthood that we also see alluded to both the Old and New Testament. We don't see that Muslims don't have that concept, so they're not understanding this. So again, that's where the conceptual disconnect comes in. This is Genesis now, 17 to 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he begat, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So as we clearly see, there was a covenant given to Ishmael, and that covenant was dealing with making him great and blessing him, as we see Ishmael is a great people even to this very day and have been since, you know, um, what, what we call the Middle Ages. But even with that being said, this covenant, the covenant that was given to us that was elaborated in the previous verse, Exodus 19 to 6, to be a, a kingdom of priests, that was not given to them. So this is why they're not understanding the importance of the sacrifice of Christ, right? So I'm going to go now back to the gospel, and I'm going to go here to John 11 and verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees the council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men shall be, will believe on him. 
and the Romans shall come and take both away our place and nation. A and one of them, you said what? Minute thirty seconds left. Minute thirty seconds. All right, cool. And one of them named Caiaphas, being high priest that same year, said unto them, "Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not." This was an understanding that the high priest had. Had why didn't he have it? Because he understood the law and the prophets, and the emphasis put on it that one man should die for the people. I'll, I'll leave off there. See y'all in a minute again. I'll praise you. How about you, now, Shai? Okay, no doubt, no doubt. We're gonna turn it over to the Imam Bashir. That was a very informative round. I mean, uh, on a part of Gorilla Hebrew. Um, so we're gonna turn it over to the Imam. If you haven't done so, hit the like button. That helps me out a whole lot. Um, you ready, Imam? Yes, sir. Okay, without further ado, your 15 minutes starts now. Yes, family. So uh, we're going to get right into this thing and we're going to go to the scripture. And I want you to listen to the scripture attentively and to the context. Now, the first thing they want to um, tell us is that a man who is special, like Jesus, may peace be upon him, was a cursed man. So the Bible clearly, clearly identifies the individual that is hung by the tree or hung by the cross as being a curse. And they even call him cursed. So if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 to 23, this is the King James Version. And it says, and if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, has committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is a curse of God, and thy land not be defiled, which the Lord thy God given thee for the inheritance. So this is clearly saying that only a cursed people, people that is cursed by the creator, is put on the cross to hang and die. This is very, very important. Um, when, we, when we go to, and I want to just jump into this, and let's listen to um, what Jesus himself says. In the scripture and i want you to turn your bibles and once again all of my references are going to be in king james version and i want you to turn your bibles to luke chapter 11 verse 29 through 30. now the people are asking jesus may peace be upon him for a sign and he tells them he's going to give them a sign so let's find out what this sign is so again that's luke chapter 11 verse Verses 29 and 30, we're going to read. And he, this Jesus talking, and he says, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign. They ask him Jesus for a sign. He says, They seek a sign. There shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas, the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the son of man be to this generation now why is this why is this very important because one listen again he actually says this is an evil generation jesus talking they seek a sign and he says and no and there is no sign he's clear there is no sign shall be given to it but the sign of jonah the prophet so this is the only sign they have to deal with for as Jonas was assigned unto the Nevites, um, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. So let's go further. If you look at um, chapter Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 to 40, it also says that, but he, and, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, this is very important. Why is this important? Well, let's go and let's go find out about this sign that Jesus himself said will be the only sign. And let's go to the chapter that says Jonah. Let's look at it. 
Now it's Jonah chapter one, verse 17, and then chapter two, verses one and two. So it says, this is the sign of Jonah. Now the Lord has prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou hearest my voice. So the sign of Jonah, which Jesus compared with Jonah, was clearly to say, this is the sign for you. It's going to be the like sign of me. So Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days or the big fish for three days and three nights. And he made a prayer and he came out and was vomited out of this big fish and he made it alive. This is the only sign for an adulterous generation and an evil generation that Jonah survived and did not die when it was a situation that looked like death would come, but no death actually came to Jonas. And this is why the sign is the only sign for the people that Jesus um, laid PCP upon him gave. So if we understand that, we have to understand that Jesus did not die because his prayers was answered. But let's, let's prove this further. Let's go into um, chapter... Let's go into Matthew chapter 27, verse 19. Now, we got to hear about this guy named Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor of Palestine at the time. And I'm just going to give you a brief breakdown of this, and then we're going to go into scripture. But Pilate, the, the so-called Israelites or Jews, brought Jesus to be crucified and to be judged. And they wanted him to be judged. And Pilate, according to the scripture, found no fault in Jesus. And by him and his wife also had dreams and visions that Jesus was actually an innocent man. So Pilate did everything he could to take away, um, to tell these Jews or Israelites, like, listen, this man is not guilty of anything. If you want him to be guilty, you deal with him. And then they challenged um, Pilate and they said, listen, Pilate, if you don't judge this man, you are no king of Caesar. You are no friend of Caesar. You are, you know, so he was saying they intimidated him and forced him to make a decision. The decision that they wanted was for him to be crucified. So if we look at Matthew um, chapter 27, verse 19, it says, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, have thou nothing to do with that, that just man have thou nothing to do with that just man this is Pilate's wife telling him don't have nothing to do with this just man for i have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him so she's telling her husband and pleading with her husband that listen i've been having these dreams this guy is innocent this man is innocent so do not um crucify him so when we go further and and we can turn to chapter to um we could turn to luke Chapter 23, verse 14 in the scripture. And it says, said unto them, he have brought this man unto me as one that perreth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, have not have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accused him. So Pilate is now saying, I don't find any fault of this man. Let's go further in the story to John chapter 18, verses 38 through 40. So Pilate says unto him, what is, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find him no fault at all, but ye have a custom. He said, they have a custom that I should release unto you one at Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. So he was meant to be crucified with another individual. But Pilate again is saying, hey, I find no fault in this man. When we look further into John chapter 19, verses um, 12, we start, he says, and from therefore, 
Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh him a king speaketh against Caesar. And then on chapter, the same chapter, verse 31, it explains how the Jews caused him to be, um, it, it says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day is a high day, but sought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might have taken them away. Now, Pilate went through with it and he actually put him on a cross and said, you guys want them on the cross, we'll put them on the cross. But he put them on the cross on, on um, where there were six or nine hours left in the Sabbath because it was unlawful for anyone to hang on the cross on the Sabbath. And therefore, he said the time is running out. So he told the, the soldiers to actually hurry up and get this done because the Sabbath is coming. Kill these guys. Now break their legs because they're not going to be dead. So we're going to break their legs and make them suffer, which is going to cause the body to go in shock and further kill them while they're hanging on the cross. So chapter um, verse 32 says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear, with a spear, pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. So this is very important. They did not break the legs of Jesus, but they broke the legs of others thinking that he was, he was dead. And therefore, when they put the, the uh, pierced his side, blood and water spewed forth. Now we know medically, once you are dead, your heart stops pumping and blood stops circulating and, and the blood starts to coagulate. It starts to slow down. It starts to get a gel-like substance. But because it was pierced and it spewed out blood and water, this is a clear indication of the heart being pumped. This is why when you get an IV and you stick the IV in, they hurry up and put a gauze on top of it before they pull the IV out because it's going to spurt. If you um, do any type of embalming or any person that has died, if you poke them, blood will come out, but it would not spur out because the blood, the heart is not no longer pushing or pumping blood through the veins throughout the body. It shows that there was a sign of life. And once again, he was his, his legs were not broken. So if we go, if we go to um, Ch John, Chapter 19, verse 39, we can see that um, Nicodemus had actually brought myrrh and Ilo to um, Jesus where he was hanging. So he's hanging on the cross and he's being brought healing agents such as myrrh and Ilo, which is used in ancient times to actually heal wounds. This is a fact. Um, now, once we go to John 19, John chapter 19, Verses, uh, let's go to first, uh, let's see here. Let's get to it. Matter of fact, let's go to um, John chapter 20, verses 13 through 17. Now, and this is important. The scripture says, and they said unto her, woman, why thou weepest thou? This is what the scripture says. Two angels was at the tomb of Jesus. He was at the tomb and they asked her, why she weepest thou? She said unto them, because thy Lord has been taken, because they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. And then, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, right? and knew not that it was Jesus. This is according to scripture. She didn't know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom are you seeking? She supposing him to be the gardener, says unto him, sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. Now, let's just listen to that. Here is Mary going to the, to the tomb where Jesus is laid, and then she's having this conversation with a guy 
that is standing there. She supposes him to be a gardener. Now she's like, where is Jesus? And then he turns around and say, Mary. And she recognizes his voice, but she thought that he was a gardener. Why would she think a resurrected man was a gardener? Because obviously he had on a uniform and clothing of a gardener. You understand? Which goes to show two things. One, he was in disguise, according to the story. Two, she did not find him laying dead, but she found him in a state that was alive. Now, this is what the kicker is. The next verse in 17, verse 17 says, Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. So here is Jesus actually telling her, don't touch me. He's in pain, obviously. Don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father. Um, that means I have not gone up. I have not left. I am still here. But then he said, but go tell, go tell my brethren. Go tell my brethren, brethren is family, but go tell them that I did ascend. Go tell them I, I did go up until my father and your father and to my God and to your God. You understand? So it is clear. Um, and, and, and in the second round, I'm going to get more into that. But it is clear that at this very point, Jesus was assumed to be dead and the crucifixion process was not actually enacted on him entirely. His legs wasn't broken. When Mary went to the tomb, she seen a man there standing there, supposed him to be a gardener. He yelled out to her. Then once he yelled out to her, she heard his voice and she said, Master. And then she obviously she would want to touch him. He said, don't touch me for I have not yet ascended to my father. All and right. What, your time uh, is up. All right. Um, yo, this, this is like, you know what I mean? It's pretty lit. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm, I'm already privy to a lot of the uh, perspectives. So it was like, um, Gorilla Hebrew kind of brought something to the table that I never heard before, though. You know what I'm saying? Because So you know he's doing that counterpunching thing that he you know, that he does uh, very well. But Bashir, they done a lot of Bible verses, you know, um, stating his claim that I was very familiar with. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting forward, I'm looking forward to seeing that lightning round. That's what I'm looking forward to. But um, you ready, Gorilla Hebrew? Yes, sir. All right, let me set the timer. And this is the 10 minute this is the 10 minute uh, second round premise. So you got 10 minutes and your time right. starts now. All right, perfect. Again, I'll praise you by Shami Abu Shai. Um, just in brief responding, this is why I laid the premise with predominantly prophet and gospel red letter, the words of who the world calls Christ, Yahweh Shai. Um, because again, these are preeminent things. These are things that both Bible and Quran emphasize as i've been saying over and over throughout this debate and i want to continually emphasize it because if we just pay attention to red letter and to prophecy we see how problematic the argument and the conclusions that the brother is coming to are right so first and foremost let's go here um he, he talks about christ being a curse but he wasn't worthy of being cursed uh again isaiah 53 and 9 and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was my, was any deceit in his mouth. So here it's all a part of prophecy that he was not going to have been worthy of death, but he was going to have to get on the cross and die, right? So that's that's clearly in the prophecy that we've read here. Now, this is probably the fourth or fifth time we've gone over it, right? Now, he, he emphasizes the sign of Jonas, right? And, and, and that being the only sign that was going to be given to this generation. But he doesn't understand the other prophecies that elaborate on this in other parts of the scripture. So let's go to another prophecy that elaborates on the prophecy of Jonas, etc. The sign of Jonas. This is Hosea 6 and 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and, and he will heal us, and he has smitten us, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day will he raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Right? So all of that, the whole crucifixion process of Christ, is what Christ was referencing with the whole 
uh, sign of Jonah. And this is something that we're going to get into um, with uh, the debate in regards to um, the, the, the literal or the metaphysical uh, resurrection of Christ and the different layers to it. You see what I'm saying? But all of this goes into the sign of Jonah on things being risen after the third day, right? So, uh, so like you're moving forward. Um, I want to go here, matter of fact, Isaiah 53 and 9 again, and he made his grave with the wicked, right? So when you deal with Jonah, like you said, he was in hell, uh, meaning a hellish condition in, in the instance of Jonah. Why? Because he wasn't actually dead. You could actually live in the side, like a, a large enough, uh, uh, Amphibian animal, you can actually live in their stomach. It's possible, right? Because if the water don't rise high enough, you actually do have pockets of air. They are air breathing. They need oxygen. They don't spend all day underwater. So he was in a hellish condition while he was in that the belly of that beast. But Christ wasn't in a hell. He really went into a grave. Again, for Isaiah 3 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. So again, we have to continually go back to the prophets because they all attest to one another and they all attest to the death of Christ on the cross, right? Because it's prophetically was announced prior to, right? So the brother also talked about dealing with the sign of Jonas. Jonas praying his way out of the belly of the beast and then Christ praying his way out of the crucifixion. But we see that that is highly problematic and we're just gonna go to the red letter here. Uh, Matthew 16 and 21. From that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee. Right. He said it again. Jesus said that he must suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed so out of his own mouth. That's red letter and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, the same thing that Imam Bashir is saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he, who is he, Christ, Yahweh, shall I turn, and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, rebuking Satan that was on him. He said, he said, Only Satan would have compelled him to say that he shouldn't have to die. And in the same way, now we're dealing with it, looking at it in retrospect, in the past tense, since only the spirit of Satan would compel one to say that he didn't die on that cross. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of the most high God, but those that be of man. You savor your relationship and how you feel towards me and not the thing that God had ordained aforetime in prophecy and mandated that he had to get on the Christ and die. That's the thing of God. So when you forsake the concept of Christ dying in the crucifixion, you are forsaking the prophecy and the things of God. It has to be understood. This is red letter. This is right out of the mouth of the man in question. He said that he had to be killed. And he says that any objection to his death was not loving God, but rather loving Satan's man and following the ways of man which I believe are things that we are all adamantly against. I'm going to go to another witness, same gospel, Matthew, but I'm going to go 10 chapters later, Matthew 26 and 39, because the brother insinuated that, that uh, Yahweh Shai, the world calls Christ, prayed his way out of the crucifixion. It's Matthew 26 and 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, this is what he prayed now, this was his prayer, if it be possible, right? If, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. That was his prayer. And it's important that we understand that. He says, if it's possible, but nevertheless, thy will be done, not mine. That's what he showed us when he showed us how to pray in Matthew the sixth chapter. Um, Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's important to understand the will of the Most High being done. So let's see what the will of the Most High is going back to the prophets, back to Isaiah 53, and we're going to start at the 10th verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased Yahweh to bruise him. What is his pleasure? That's his will. What is his will? Christ said, "Thy in his prayer, thy will be done. What is his will? Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, it pleased the Most High to put Christ, who the world calls Christ, Yahweh Shai, as a sin offering for the nation of Israel. That was pleasing to him. Right? He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. 
he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Uh, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. How did, their, how did he bear our iniquities? Through his death. It's important to understand that. Now with all that being responded to, I'm going to go back to the point I left off on through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai here in John 11. And I'm going to start back at the top of verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. So he's rebuking these people. Y'all don't know nothing. He does know something. He's qualified. Why? Because he's a high priest. He's been trained in the tutelage and knowledge of Torah and prophets, right? Verse 50. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Him understanding the prophecies is telling them how stupid are y'all? Don't y'all know that one man has to die for us? Verse 51. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, meaning he was in authority. He prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together and one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then, then from that day forth, they took counsel together to put him to death. So the high priest, understanding that one man had to die, made sure that he joined together in a conspiracy to make sure that he was put to death. That's what that whole situation that the brother was reading about was. That's why they said, no, nah, it don't matter. We don't want Stan Barabbas. Let him die. Why? Because this was all ordained in prophecy. And it was all a part of a conspiracy to make sure the prophecy happened. All a part of the overall will of God. Now watch this. This is Matthew 26, and I'm going to start at 62. This is when the high when 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 uh, Christ has been captured now, and he's being presented to the high priest in the council of the priests and Pharisees. Verse sixty-two, and the high priest arose, same guy Caiaphas, and said unto him, "Answer is thou nothing? What is that which uh, which uh, which these witnesses witness against thee?" But Jesus held his peace. Notice he holds his peace. Real quick, going back to Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. This happened exactly according to prophecy. So if we see every detail of the prophecy matching up point for point, how is the death part left out? How did the will of God change in that instance? It's nonsensical. Again, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Again, verse 63 starts with what? But Jesus held his peace, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so is he, so is he openeth not his mouth. Who are the shearers? The, the priests, because the priests sacrifice the lambs, right? Going back to Matthew uh, 26 and 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be Christ, the Son of God. In verse 64, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, and it's interesting because Christ 30 seconds, brother. Really, he wrote 30 seconds. He's Perfect. Thou has said, real quick, going back to John 11 and 49, and one of them named Caiaphas being high priest that year said, nothing did he know nothing at all. Basically, he attests to the fact, as we just previously read, that he is the Christ. Uh, it's unfortunate my time is running out, but I want to I want to get back to this because this is a very important point to hammer in on understanding all this. But I'm going to yield the time back to my beloved brother, Imam Bashir. Okay, okay, no doubt, no doubt. Um, now... If you're interested in entering this debate league, you can reach me at solarmind123 at gmail.com. I'll be posting it in the chat room. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's one thing to make comments in the chat room. It's another thing to step in the ring. That's two totally different situations right there. And I see a lot of y'all, you know, going against the Imam, but, I, you know, he is open to debate whatever you want to talk about. So... You can reach me at solarmind123 at gmail.com if you want to enter this debate league and uh, get it in. Information is information is power, so definitely. We're looking for everybody's perspective. Don't matter what you is, Hebrew, Israelite, Moor, Muslim, NOI, whatever whatever the case may be, Nuwabian, whatever whatever your perspective, come on in. We can, we can debate the topic or we can invite you on to have a discussion. So with that being said, we're going to turn it over back to the baby face imam. Let me set the timer. And your 10 minutes starts now. 
They afraid to lose their Jesus on that cross, but it's okay. We still bringing you to a lot. Now, listen, um, I'm going to go back for, for a moment and just, just just um listen to the prayer of Jesus. May peace be upon him. We will go to Luke chapter 22, verse 42. And yes, he says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not your my will, but thy will be done. So you're saying a prayer that says, listen, I don't take this from me. I don't want this death. I don't want this crucifixion. Take this from me. Very important. So let's go back to um, when he is inside the tomb. Not a grave, but a tomb that has air, has oxygen, has room to move. A tomb. All right. So Jesus goes and says, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father. I have not went up, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God. As the story continue, um, verses 18, the next verse, Mary Magdalene, this is who was at the, at the um, tomb. She came and told the disciples, I'm going to paraphrase this, you can read it. But she came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he has spoken these things unto her. So what is she about to tell them? She is about to tell them exactly what he said. Go tell my brethren. It didn't happen. It's not true. But go tell them that I have what ascended, which starts to bring this, um, this thought or ideal that he was ascended to the father and now he's back to return. He's saying this because he is in fear of their life. The Jews was in fear of their lives. This is why they were hiding. This is why they left this crucifixion site themselves. But it goes on in chapter 19. It then said, then the same day at evening, the, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, bled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, peace. Fear unto you. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Peace be up to you. And then chapter verse 20, excuse me, verse 20. It says, and when he had said, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his sides. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So he went and showed them. Then chapter um, um, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again. Peace be unto you, assalamu alaikum, as my father has sent me, even so, even so send I you. And then you can read the story further on. But there was one that was not there by the name of Thomas. And Thomas was skeptical. Like, I've seen this guy on the cross. You guys telling me, I'm not going to believe that he is here until I physically see him. And going down to verse 28. In the same chapter, it says, chapter 20, we're reading, verse 28. It says, and uh, before that, excuse me, verse 26, we'll start there. And after eight nights, again, his disciples were within, were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Assalamu alaikum, shalom, peace be upon you, peace be unto you. Then says he to Thomas, reach hither my, thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faith, faithless, but believing. And then it goes, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord, my God, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many of the signs truly, verse 30, and many of the signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, as we analyze the story thus far, we can clearly see that inside the tomb, there was a man there dressed like a gardener. 
Why was he dressed like the gardeners? Because this is clear disguise. It's clearly he was in disguise and he was up. He was not laying in a dead position. Then Jesus calls out unto, unto Mary Magdalene. Well, first she asks, who is, where have you put him? She's asking this guy that looks like a gardener. Where have you laid my Lord? Where is Jesus? And then he says, Mary. She recognized his voice. And then she says, he says, Mary. And she says, oh, master, Raboni, master. And then she goes on and he says, hold up now, paraphrasing. Don't touch me. In fact, I go chapter 20, um, John 20, 17. I'll read the exact words. Jesus said on her, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father. Let's stop right there. He's, he's clearly in pain. He's clearly wounded. This is for sure. But then he goes and says again, I am not yet ascended to my father. Not yet. It has not happened yet. But go to my brethren, brethren his family, and say unto them, I ascend unto my father. I am sin. Tell them I ascend to my father. And then he goes and says, you know what? I want to make this clear. It's your father too. And then I want to make this clear. And to my God. And make it clear again. And your God. Which is showing that this is not uh, um, something where there's, there's this special relationship. But the relationship is special due to an understanding and not due to a bloodline, which is very important. And so the man that was asked to be crucified or said that he laid down his life did not want his life laid down because in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, before the, they even came to the cross, if you read that story about the crucifixion, he prayed that the cup be taken from him then. That's before he was turned over to um, Pontius Pilate. That's before he was turned over. And once you read further in the story, you will find that he told Peter he should have his sword at the door and be on guard so he would not be taken. But of course, Judas sold him out. And that's how he was taken. So continuing through the story, he goes to, the, to his disciples, his friends, still in this disguise when no one else is seeing him who he told mary magdalene to go tell them i have went to the father i have when he did not clearly from the scripture and then he went and showed them their hands his hands he showed them there's wounds he was like look at me this is my hands and my wounds and the aloe of, of myrrh was used to help Healed him. And then he went to Thomas, who was not there. Thomas wasn't believing Jesus was able to be in, in the presence. And so he said, look, take your finger, feel me, touch me, put your finger in my side, feel my wounds. I'm alive, man. And the scripture also says in that story clearly that they feared for them, their lives. So a person... And, and when they put the spear inside of Jesus in the scripture that we read, blood flow. Now, if you don't want to, you know, uh, be in reality as to how a heart pumps and how blood is moved and circulated throughout the body. And if you don't understand that blood and water spewing out is a sign of life, then you, my friend, it's only in stuck in faith and belief, but not into the knowing. So the scriptures is clearly telling us that he said, peace be unto you. And that, listen, um, I am here. I am alive. I am with you. And then John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in his presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. The book itself tells us that there is other things, other signs. There's many signs, even though it contradicts Jesus' statement. Although he said, listen, 
They ask for a sign, this evil generation, this adulterous generation, but I'm going to give you the sign of Jonas. And when we read the scripture of Jonas, Jonas prayed to be relieved from the well bellies. He was prayed to be out of that temptation. Jesus himself in Luke 22, verse 42, seconds, Luke 22, verse 42, he also made the prayer to be relieved from that accursed death. Your time is up. Yes. All right, family. We're going to uh, now go into the conclusion of this debate, which will be five minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set this timer for five minute closing. And uh, Gorilla Hebrews time is set. You ready, Gorilla Hebrew? Yes, sir. All right, your five minutes starts now. All right, perfect. Um, I'm going to start here at uh, uh, Matthew 64, right? Here at Matthew 64, and said, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, right? This is right after the high priest asked Jesus, Are you the Son of God? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds to him, Thou hast said, responding to um, what was, or, or in, with the knowledge that in John 11, he acknowledged that he was the Christ, he was the Messiah, right? So moving on, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said this, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven, right? So what happens is they're having this interaction. Caiaphas goes for one last confirmation. Are you the Messiah? To prove he's the Messiah, Yahweh Shai, who the world calls Christ, answers Caiaphas and says, you said this. How else would he know what went on in that council? Of course he had that foreknowledge given to him by his father. So with that, Caiaphas ain't need no more confirmation. Him understanding the scriptures, understanding all the things that needed to happen, moved forward. So now skipping to verse 67 in Matthew 26, this is key. Then they did spit in his face. Whose face shall I shine Christ? And buffeted him. And others smote him with the palm of their hand, with the palms of their hand. So here we have a congregation of priests. So they begin to smote him distinctively and precisely with the palms of their hands. There's a reason for that. They had the trial. They brought him before. They had determined that he was the Messiah. Then they laid the palms of their hands or they smote him with the palms of their hands. This is important. And here's why. Going back to Numbers, the 8th chapter and the 10th verse. And this is what's going to bring the whole understanding of this sacrifice full circle. Why it had to happen the way it had to happen and why Christ had to die. Numbers 8 and 10. And thou shalt bring the Levites, whom the priests are, before Yahweh. And the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. So the heads of the children of Israel came and put their hands on the Levitical priest, verse 11. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before Yahweh for an offering of the children of Israel. So the entire tribe of Levi was offered as the offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of Yahweh. And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks. So basically, it's like a power of attorney. Israel puts all their sins on Levi, and then Levi lays their hand on the bullocks to execute them and kill them, and that's how we make atonement for sins. So again, and the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks, and they shall offer uh, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering unto Yahweh to make an atonement for the Levites. So that was the MO that the Most High God had established in Israel with the priesthood to make an atonement of sins, which I can understand why Muslims don't understand that. They don't have the priesthood. But as we can see here, it's clearly outlined in Torah. Torah, again, another thing, along with the prophets and the gospel that is emphasized over and over in the Quran. So as we can see, what will happen, Israel came and laid their hand on the Levites, which gave Levites power of attorney over the sin, which they would give to the bullocks, which they would slay in order to make a sin offering for the Lord. So when the Levitical priests call Christ and they say, are you the Messiah? When he says, thou hast said this, what did they do? They buffed him. They put the palms of their hands upon him. What did they do then? They transferred that sin the same way they would transfer the sin of Israel onto the bullocks and kill them for the atonement. They transferred that onto Christ, which is why when Christ went on to that cross, he had to die because all the sins of Israel were put on him pursuant to the prophecy, which I've emphasized over and over again in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Right. 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, hit some more scriptures on this. It's John three and four, more, uh, three and fourteen, rather more red letter. And Moses, a Levitical priest, lifted up the serpent, and as rather Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's what has to happen. You understand what I'm saying? The Son of Man has to be lifted up by a Levitical priest. That's exactly what happened with Caiaphas and Christ. All right. Going more to red letter, uh, Matthew 27 uh, and uh, 23. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate, which his brother referenced already, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. So, so see ye to it, verse 25, then answered all the people and said, his blood be upon us and our children. So people, Christians, Muslim, people don't understand this. When the Israelites say, let his blood be upon us and our children. People are not understanding what's going on. They think of it as some gruesome, cruel, uh, uh, inhumane murder. But watch this, 1 Peter 1 and 2. Elect to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So that also goes into Levitical ritual of the sacrifice. Ten seconds, that was bro. Ten seconds. Right. So you had to be sprinkled with the blood. So as we see here, the Levitical priest would lay hands upon a sacrifice and kill it and sprinkle the blood. And that's the whole thing that Christ happened was the priest lay hands on him, crucified him. And that's why Israel said, let his blood be upon us because we were sanctified through the sprinkling of his blood through that Levitical and ritual. Die. All right. All priests. All right, man. This, this shit is all right. This shit is kind of lit right here. You know what I mean? Um, we're going to turn it over to the Imam to give his final, well, his closing. And then we're going to we're gonna uh, get into the lightning round. So, you ready, uh, Imam Bashir? Yes, sir. All right. Your five minutes starts now. All right, family. So, we heard a lot, but I want to leave you with these concluding verses. Um, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, it says, but he answered and said unto them, this is Jesus talking, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it. Let me take from my Hebrew Israelites brother. What he said, seek after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it. How many signs? What other signs? No sign shall be given to it. But the sign of the prophet Jonas, verse 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of the Neivite shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Jonas' prophecy was the sign that Jesus himself, so it don't matter what Paul say, it don't matter what Luke say, it don't matter what Mark say as it pertains to signs, it matters what the man himself said, that there will only be one sign, and that sign was um, Jonas. Jonas, when we read Jonas chapter 1, verse 17, and then... Um, and then chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, we see that Jonas was in the well's belly and he prayed for that to be taken away from him and he that was taken away from him and he made it alive. He made it alive. That's the sign that there was three days and three nights in the belly of a well. There was three days and three nights in a tomb. There was three days and three nights with a, um, death lurking, but life was given and no one died. And there was three days and three nights in a tomb where life was there and no one died. And then as you go with Pilate, um, not wanting to crucify Jesus. His wife not wanting to crucify Jesus. So the Jews wanted him to be crucified. So he said, you know what? I washed my hands clean of this. You guys want this? Okay, this is your judgment. But then it was clear that six or nine hours before the Sabbath came. So he was only on the cross for approximately six or nine hours according to the scripture. Now, with that being said, why is that very important? That's because at the end of the day, he wanted to stop the stop the um, 
the crucifying because he didn't want to really kill that man. These people wanted him dead, but he knew that, you know what? If we put him on a cross on the, when the Sabbath come, when sunset comes, we're going to have to take them off because that is the practice of the Jews. They do not allow the people to hang for the Sabbath. So then he ordered them when time was clicking, the, sap, the sun was starting to set. Before the sun started to set, he sent the soldiers to break the legs, break the legs of everyone. There were two other people being crucified along with Jesus, and then their legs was broken. When they came to Jesus, his legs were not broken. Um, they did not, excuse me, they did not break his legs because they assumed that he was dead. They assumed that he was already dead. So instead of breaking the legs, what did they do? They pierced his side, his side with a spear, and then water gushed out. Blood gushed out, which shows clearly that the heart is still pumping and still delivering blood throughout the body. Once the heart stops pumping, the blood begins to coagulate. It's not an instant coagulation, but there's no more force that is being pushed through the body. The force stops and the blood starts to drain. If he was hanging up, the blood would start running towards his feet and it would not have been spurring out. That showed life. Then as we go to the tomb, Mary Magdalene goes inside the tomb. She sees a man that looks like a gardener. He's in a gardener uniform. This is why she supposed him to be the gardener as the scriptures say. And then she asks, where is Jesus? Where has I laid him? Because obviously there's no one there laying down. There's a man standing up who looks like a gardener. He says, Mary. She says, Raboni master. And then after she says, Master, he says, hey, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father, but go tell my brethren that I have ascended to my father, your father, my God, your God. She went and did that. Then when she went, he went and met the, the brothers and the, and the disciples that was hiding, that was scared, that was afraid for them lives, as the scriptures say. He goes and say, I'm here. Touch me. Feel me. I made it. I'm alive. I'm here. And he actually goes on in his life. This is why they give you the story that he flew up in the sky. This is why they give you a story Sorry. that he ascended. Sorry. Um. Yeah, yeah. So... We're going to set this lightning round up. I'm going to set it for 10 minutes. And once again, if you're interested in getting into this debate league, now I'm going to warn y'all, it's a lot easier to type up in the chat room. It's a whole different story to get up here and break down your science. So I'm going to post my Gmail in the chat room. If you want to set up a debate with one of the debaters, or maybe you want to call somebody out or come on the show and drop some knowledge. If you want to come on and drop some knowledge, let everybody know who you is and what you teach. You can reach me at solarmind123 at gmail.com. I'll be posting it up in the chat room. So with that being said, and, uh, open open brother, before up. you go, before you go, can I, um, can I get a plug in, you know, for the people real quick? Go ahead. No doubt. Um, you know, um, right now you can hit me up at uh, Bashir Hawk, B A S H I R H A Q Q at yahoo.com. You can also um, Annie up on my Facebook, Bashir Abdul Hawk. Come hit me up. Um, I, I expect to have some students that's going to learn this knowledge, and I want y'all to come and I want you to take your shahada and accept today. And if there's anyone that wants to accept today, put it in the chat room today. That I heard the truth. You want to learn the truth about Jesus. You want to set the day of Islam, and we'll get you there today, for sure. Okay. Now, with that being said, we're going to set this thing off. My favorite part <laughs> of the debate, the lightning round. So, we're going to give Gorilla Hebrew the first question, and the ten minutes starts now. Whatever you want to ask him. All right. Perfect. All right. Peace, beloved brother Imam Bashir. Just real quick. Uh, I want to get your understanding of this scripture, like here in the, uh, the prophets, Isaiah 53 and 9, which I emphasize uh, throughout the debate. And he made his grave with the wicked and, and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So when we see the prophets echoing that a death of this Messiah would have to occur, um, I, you know, how do you how do you feel about that? What is your interpretation of, of those scriptures? 
I would say that any scripture that is referring to Jesus um, actually being dead is a fallacy because it's clear that the sign that Jesus himself, the word spoke to by himself, not a third party, but the words that came from him in first person clearly established that there is no sign for them except the sign for Jonas. And that sign was clear that he will he will be inside some enclosure for three days and three nights, and he will also live. That's the uh, and he will also pray for that forgiveness. That's the three things that happened to Jonas, and that's the very three things that happened to Jesus. Jonas prayed to be relieved. Jesus prayed to be relieved. Um, Jonas was in the well for three, three days, three nights. Jesus was in the tomb three days, three nights. Um, and then you also have the big factor where they came out alive. So him making the comparison with Jonah only makes common sense. It only makes scriptural sense that he too would survive what, what, what we commonly known or felt like um, they would be destroyed or dead. So he recovered. So with that, I will ask you a counter question in regards to that. And I will ask you um, about, uh, you know, the Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40, in regards to the sign um, that Jesus spoke, I would like to ask you a two-part question. Was that Jesus spoke it, speaking directly in first person? And how many signs did he say will be given for his situation? Uh, yeah, that was him speaking directly in first person. He definitely said it was one sign, and that sign would be the sign of the prophet Jonah. Um, if we examine both of those situations side by side, we see Jonah get thrown off a boat, gets uh, uh, swallowed by a large fish, and remain in that fish for a period of time of three days before he is spat out. Um, in the same, we see a similar situation with Christ, but not, of course, an identical situation. We can take the cogs of it, and we understand that he was stuck somewhere for three days, but like in the case of Jonah, in Jonah 2, when he says he was in hell, which hell is you know it can be applied hebraically conditionally to you know describe the type of condition you're in or it can be uh, literally in a, in a tomb or a grave where you're laying dead as well so i would say that in in that instance in that aspect um it would apply to uh an actual death and um i'll i'll, I'll just reference this scripture on it um which is also a red letter out of the mouth of christ in the same gospel just 14 chapters later uh Matthew 26 and 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, uh, saying, Oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will, as you said, because he prayed and, uh, uh, and whatnot, right? But as thou will, again, we go here to Isaiah 53 and 10, yet it, is, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he had put him to grief. That because that's his will. This was all the Lord's will. The Lord's will was to put him to grief, to bruise him, and, to, and for him to die. Uh, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, that's the will of God. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. Uh, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear the iniquities of many. So him being a sacrifice and dying on that cross. It's all a part of what the will of the Lord was, and that's why Christ emphasized to him, that will be done, that was his will, so I believe that, in fact, is what happened. Okay, so I will ask you um, uh, another, another two-part question. I will ask you, um, would death, um, you know, be the, the greatest thing or comparison or being able to live in retrospect to Jonas, you know, living? So, so, for example, let me rephrase. If Jesus is going to die on the cross three days, three nights, um, and Jonas lived, and he said that he was greater than Jonas, why would he use the prophecy of Jonas if Jonas did not die? Um, because him showing the example of him being greater than Jonas, Jonas was not the spotless or, or blameless uh, lamb that was had the ability to be offered in the manner in which Christ was. Christ was, you know, a man without deceit, a man who was blameless. So he was fit to be that lamb offering. You see what I'm saying? That uh, that, that Passover, that sin, that iniquity offering, when in the case of Jonah, he wasn't necessarily. So that's why he could, and that's why also Christ in his teaching says there's no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. You see what I'm saying? So all of that goes in how he lived his life and what he taught and what the prophets taught. Okay, would you say that Pilate, um, you know, the, the governor of Palestine, 
that he actually, would you agree that he did not want Jesus killed and that he um, put him on the cross for about six to nine hours? Would you would you agree with that or no? Um, I would agree that he didn't want him killed. And I believe everybody who was um, on the on the crosses that day were all on it for the same amount of time. OK. And, and would you agree um, as far as the heart is concerned, pumping that blood spewing out? Would you agree that that means that the heart is pumping and moving blood throughout the body and the heart has not stopped? Um, not not necessarily. Um, it, it could occur very uh, early after, you know, when the when the um, when death occurs or when rigor mortis is, is in, in its initial stages. And, I, and I'll explain why and what I mean by that. Um, we're going to go to my apologies. Uh, the scripture that is speaking with that, I believe it's where is it? It's in the 19th chapter. What is that? Mark 19 or that's John 19? Uh, the account of this. Um, gotta be, gotta be John. My apologies. Uh, John, I believe it's 19. Yeah, John 19, 31 through 34. Right, exactly. See, we, if we read this contextually, we're going to start at verse 30, because this is what it's going to let us know what happens. And it's a very uh, quick chain of events. Verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So this same thing you're saying is Christ's death. He gave the ghost up. He's dead. Right. Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was a high holy day, but saw Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers. Again, now, they besought Pilate about it, not, not vice versa. Verse 32. Then the soldiers came and break the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his sides and forthwith came there out blood and water. Why? Because he just gave the ghost up. So this is why it's still squirting, because that death was fresh. The heart literally just stopped. Um, so the blood, like you were speaking about, is not coagulated. Um, and, he, and, he, and, and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that what he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scriptures might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken, right? That's why his legs weren't broken. Again, this is the scripture on that, Psalms 34 and the 20th verse. Um, uh, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. That's scripture, right? Then uh, verse, so like your verse uh, 37, and another scripture, they shall look upon him when they have pierced, which is Zechariah, uh, the 12th chapter and the 10th verse, that they shall look upon him there. So his piercing and his bones not being broken was all a part of prophecy, the same prophecies that also say that he would be killed. And again, if we just go to verse 30, it says, uh, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So there was his death right there in verse 30. Okay. Um, so I have another follow-up question now I'd like to ask you, brother. Um, so when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and um, she sees Jesus there dressed as a gardener, which is a two part, part question. Why would you suppose that he was dressed as a gardener? And why did he tell her, I have not yet ascended, but go tell my brethren that I have ascended? Um, as for why he was dressed as a gardener, I couldn't uh, speak to that. But as far as the whole ascension thing, when he gave the ghost up, his spirit left his body or his spirit ascended, but the, the bodily ascension, because he still had to show that same body unto his disciples that was bruised. And then they see him ascend later on. You see what I mean? So basically he yielded up the ghost and that ascension, but his, his grand uh, physical ascension of that physical body did not occur until after he spent them 40 days with his, uh, with his uh, uh, disciples. Okay, can you give us a, a verse where Jesus himself, not someone else, not third person, where Jesus himself say, my spirit ascended, but my body didn't ascend? Uh, I just read it, that John 19 and 30, when he says, it is finished, and he yielded up the cause. This is not, this is not the words of Jesus, you, you agree? Well, I, it's red letter, John uh, 19 and 30 is red letter. No, he gave up the ghost. It's not Jesus' word. That's somebody saying that he gave up the ghost. Oh, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. That's, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. So the only thing there is that he would say is it's finished, yes? 
Oh, so yeah, what I'm asking, okay, so what I'm asking is there, there, he was very specific when he says, I have not yet ascended, but go tell my brethren that I have ascended. Now, mm -hmm. my question to you is, why in that section do you suppose that he didn't say, I have ascended um, spiritually to the Father, but not in my body? Why? Because, I mean, he hadn't. The whole point of the ascension, going back to Zechariah 12 and 10, is for them to see that body, for everybody to take a look at that body and weep for that body, etc. So the emphasis on the ascension was bodily. That's why that's there. Okay, so if the Jews, right, <laughs> if the Jews were afraid of being tormented and being persecuted and Jesus being in a gardener um, identity or disguise, I would ask you, would a resurrected man that has ascended to the, the Father, to God, and then has returned would he act like an individual that is afraid for his life still? Um, you're, you're asserting that he's afraid for his life. You're asserting that this disguise was as a result of him being afraid for his life. Real quick, though, I have a red letter on the ascension. Um, real quick, uh, Luke 23 and 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So there's another account of him giving up the ghost and him saying, Father, I commend my spirit. So he ordered his spirit to the Father. So that, uh, I believe, is what you were looking for. My apologies, not having it um, prepared. Uh, so, when, he said, when, he said, when he said, Father, I give up that spirit, is this, is this um, an act where he says, you know, um, that take this cup from me, but it's not your will? It's not my will. It's your will. Father, you know, I give up my spirit to you, whatever it is, um, whatever it's going to be in your will. Is, is that essentially what he's saying there? Uh, I, I don't get that out of that. OK, that's fine. And um, I would like to ask you when he went to um, after a, a two part question as after the resurrection and he's in this gardener um, gardening disguise or uniform, I would like to say and he goes to his disciples. I would like to ask, why didn't he go to the people that persecuted them and showed them that I am that Christ, that Messiah, that chosen one that you have um, crucified me for? The reason why you crucified me, why is it that he never returned to those people and say, see, I am resurrected? Um, because he didn't have to. That's not a part of what he was coming to do at that time. So that I mean, that's 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 all a part of even that that whole line of questioning and thought is 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 kind of like it's rhetoric there. It's it, it's you reading into what you think should have happened in any of those uh, particular situations. You know what I mean? If we're if I'm, I'm asking this question, if we're talking about the signs of God and we're talking about, you know, miracles and we're talking about the raising of the dead and Lazarus bones and all these good things. Um, I don't think it's rhetoric. What I'm asking you is you don't think it's logical to ask the question if I was just tormented and my people, the masses of my people took me to their enemies and had me to be killed. They wanted me to be killed and all because. I said that I'm, I am the Christ that, you know, and I'm talking about the father and I'm talking about the, I'm the son of the father and that you guys are also the sons of the father. This father is your father. He's my God and your God. Why did you kill me? Are you saying it's not logical for us to ask the question? Why was the return not blatantly shown to the people that I survived your so-called crucifixion? Second part, could it be that he actually survived it, and that is the reason why he wouldn't go back, so he wouldn't t get killed again, or, or, or attempt a murder would not be, um, or, or his life would not be at risk or harm again. Um, and let this be the last question because we already went over ten minutes. All, all, all of those things that you're saying are things that, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, that's what he sent the apostles up to be the witnesses to go and preach the gospel. So all of those things were not something that was appointed for Christ to personally do. It was appointed to his apostles whom he revealed himself to, whom are his eyewitnesses, whom attest to the fact that he died. That's what their job was. 
So that is in fact why none of that occurred. You understand what I'm saying? Um, what was the other part of your question? I want to make sure I answer it adequately. Oh, that's cool, brother. Oh, you if the glove if you're, if you're being murdered. murdered. If you're being murdered, right? Yes. Yeah, it, it, to me, what, what puzzles me is how you can assert that his prayer to, to the Most High was answered through the cup passing from him, but he still was suspended on a cross, nailed to it, pierced in the side. He still went through all those tortures, though you're asserting that he didn't die through it. He still went through insurmountable tortures, which you're saying that three days later, after being in a comatose state, he wakes up and he's telling somebody not to even touch him because of how tender he still is. That damn near sounds worse than death. So how is it that a cup is being passed when somebody still went through insurmountable tortures that the average mortal man could have never survived? Don't even make that to me. That doesn't even make sense. But that's all I have on that. Okay. With that being said, we're going to turn it over to the chat room. If you have any questions, um, feel free to post it in the chat room, and uh, I'll ask the question, and uh, you know, direct it to the individual that you want to ask the question too. So yeah, I got. I, my apologies. I didn't realize. I, I got like, I got like probably like ten minutes, bro. I didn't realize it was after eight. All right, that's good enough. That's good enough. Ten minutes. All right. So um, when you got you got the questions, let it be known now. I seen a lot of questions popping up during the debate, so this is the time now to ask the question. Well, while we while we wait for no questions, can we just what you want to do, Bashir? I mean, while we waiting for some questions, you know, I'd like to thank the family for coming out. I would just like the uh, the people to, you know, um, apply the scriptures and read those scriptures that you was given, um, and particularly. You know, um, study the scriptures that I was saying and the stories that I was saying, you know, um, because it's very important. You know, um, it's not um, to take we got, away. We got a question from uh, Hassan and Awabi. He says, uh, this is to Grilly Hebrew. He says, is, is, um, is 5310, I guess that's the cry. It says that. No, Isaiah 5310. Oh, Isaiah 5310 says that the suffering servant will have children if Jesus is he did Jesus have children oh uh, yeah hold on one second um there's a scripture on that right in the New Testament let me just get it real quick hold on one second Uh, John 12 and 24. Uh, it says, uh, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So this is Christ teaching about his death and in his death, it producing many seeds. So when it says in verse 10, it pleased the Lord and it says, um, he shall see his seed. It was all the seeds that was created through his death. So that is a further attestation of the death of Christ. Okay, okay. Um, the next question is for it says that uh, okay, um Hawad, he has a question for Imam Bashir. And um the question is the question is uh, does Imam Bashir think the prophets in the Bible are real, or is Jesus the only prophet to him? That's your question. Do I think the prophets in the Bible are real? Yes. All right. Um, the next question is, is Muhammad a prophet according to the Torah? I guess that's our day too, uh, Ima. Yes, sir. And we're going to be having um, uh, this is a trilogy. So you know, when we when we return back with Brother um, Gorilla Hebrew, 
um, we'll be actually getting into that. But the, the answer is yes, Muhammad, the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, is prophesied in the Torah as well as the Gospels and Psalms as well. All right, um, the Orthodox Moor has a question for Imam Bashir. He said, did Allah or Isa lie in the Quran when they said Isa will die and be raised? Let um, me give you um, some Quranic verses. Chapter 355, 1933, 4, 157, 158. Okay, so here's the thing. When we learn, when we're reading, we have to understand what we're reading and things that are in italics and things that are in parentheses means that it's actually not in the verses. So we, we study these verses very well because my teacher, Birza Ghulam Ahmed alayhi salam, um, says that, you know, he's the uh, manifestation of the second coming of Christ. So in those very verse, you will read in the Arabic the words mutawafika. And we're actually going to get into this on, on the, uh, you know, one of the other discussions, but mutawafika is to cause to die. Tawafa is the root to mutawafika. Now, once you understand these particular um, words in those verses and know that the translations, they um, uh, transliterated, um, uh, or excuse me, not transliterated, interpolation was in place so their thoughts on the matter was put in place this is why it's, it is written in italics and then it goes to you know um standard english size bold print and when it's in parentheses as well it means it's not in the verse but the arabic is mutawafika which means to cause to die and i would i would suggest that you definitely um continue to tune in and you know go to my facebook page link up with me or go to my youtube share i'm assuming me uh my uh email bashirhawk at yahoo.com i give you information on that and follow me or bashir abdul Haq on my facebook um and this will all this information going to be coming out on my youtube channel that will be coming out soon so you can you know study all this all right Okay, um, another question from Sakari Water uh, for Bashir. It says, question for Bashir. Three prophets said the Messiah would die. They are all fallacy. Three witnesses making a mistake in prophecy. This is the question. Well, well the first thing is, is you're going to have to tell me the source of where you're getting that from because it's certainly not in the Quran um, and it's certainly not in the Bible as well. So I don't know where these prophecies are coming from, but if you could be more specific, uh, I'll give you time. I don't mind staying after a little bit after, um, brother Gorilla Hebrew to give you time to find those verses and what, um, actual books are you getting out of? And we can have that discussion. I'll answer it for you. Okay. Any more questions? Give you about two more questions. You know, if you haven't done so, hit that like button. Make sure you hit that like button. And if you're interested, once again, in joining this discussion, well, the, this debate link, you can reach me at solarmind123 at gmail.com. That's solarmind123 at gmail.com. I'll be posting it inside of the chat room. We got a few people in the building. Shout out to G Consciousness, the Orthodox Moor. He set up to go against the Imam Bash here. Um, question for Bashir, does the Quran hold more weight than the Bible? What are the implications that you that will lead you to believe that regarding the topic of a Messiah? Um, I will have to I will have to, you know, go on an assumption with the question, does the Quran holds more weight? So I would like that to be more specific. Um, but what I would say is that throughout the, the, the Bible, you have certainly great things um, that are true, um, you know, throughout it. But however, yes, it is my self. It says, um, it says that, you know, this is the perfect book. It is the guidance for the righteous. Um, and, it, it, you know, the book of the Quran also says that, you know, this journey that we've been on um, through the Torah, through the gospel, uh, all of these different prophets, that journey was coming to perfection. And the Quran actually is the manifestation of that perfection according to that book. You know, so when we look in the scripture, for example, we can see that there, um, we can see that there's Jews that, 
do not accept the prophets. So they don't accept the, the successions of the prophets and messengers. They don't accept Jesus. That's why you have Old Testament um, uh, Jews or Israelites. Um, and then you have New Testament Jews and Israelites. And the reason for that is because there were prophet, prophets in between that were not accepted as being from the creator. So, you know, you look at Elijah in the Bible, you know, you have Jews or Israelites that is, or, you know, um, they're waiting for the coming of Elijah. Their argument will be, well, Elijah did not return. And therefore, you know, Jesus cannot be the Messiah. But if you read in the, in the New Testament very closely, you will see that um, Jesus says that Elijah actually did return and he returned through the spirit or through the person um, um, John the Baptist, which Jesus also said was the greatest, um, greatest born of women, greatest born of men. You know, so um, there's a succession. I'll, I'll finish it here. And so it's the same thing with the prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, that, you know, um, those that accepted Jesus did not accept the coming of the prophet Muhammad, which me um cut off their blessings by rejecting the prophets okay so you know we don't want to hold um the gorilla hebrew too longer i see a lot of more questions is for imam bashir so if he wants to uh stay and um continue answering the questions he'll be free to do that but um uh go ahead and give your final uh closing remarks gorilla hebrew and then we can move forward from there all right, yeah, definitely. Again, I just got to give all thanks, honor, glory, praise unto the Most High God, Yahweh, through the name of His only begotten Son, who the world calls Christ, Yahweh Shai. I, I thank um, the brother Solomon for having me, as well as my uh, beloved brother Imam Bashir. I believe this was a great dialogue. I'm looking forward to the other two parts. Um, I, I, I like the building. Um, as y'all can see, me and this brother are not moving in the spirit of malice. We're not just trying to one up each other, we're not trying to come with that machismo and bravado we, we are just truly sincerely trying to get uh what we believe is the true message of our creator to the masses of our people for their own edification and understanding for their own betterment you know what i mean so that's what's so beautiful and that's why um i was so you know quick to agree to and excited about doing these debates based upon the subject matter and knowing the heart's intent of myself and as, as well as my brother i won't even call him my opponent my brother um, even though we have opposing views in certain instances, he's my brother far more than he's my, 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 my opponent, uh, Iman Bashir. So with that being said, I just want to, of course, give thanks to the most high and to my brothers and to uh, this viewing audience. And I hope um, people were edified and built by it. And with that, I say shalom. Shalom. Shout out to the gorilla Hebrew. Looking forward to the other two discussions. Oh, no, uh, gorilla, before you go. Yes, brother, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to say before you go, um, I, I agree with you, my beloved brother. I love you dearly. You're my brother. Um, there, there's, you know, in my opinion, there's no hellfire for you. You are a man of the creator. You know, um, you know, the, the Quran speaks of the actual kitab and, and that is the people of the book, the people, you know, of uh, the Israelites, the um, the so-called Christian Jews, etc., and the Sabians, those that don't have a book. So the Quran teaches us that they are my brother. There is no se separation, you know, uh, as long as they do um, the righteous deeds and give the acceptance of the Most High. And most certainly, it was an honor to be in the building tonight to, to have this um, very intelligent, very peaceful, and very informative um, discussion tonight um, about uh, 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 opposing views, and brother, you know, Sakari, you're out there doing the works. You're out there killing them, brother, on them streets. And, you know, you're building great community and doing great things, brother. And I just appreciate you in this real talk. Um, let's keep the knowledge going and let's keep the brotherhood going. And, and let's do some work, man, after, you know, all of this is said and done. So I love you, beloved, and I appreciate you. I, I sincerely do, beloved. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. So there you have it, the gorilla Hebrew. Um, so anybody, uh, do you want to stay and um, answer some of these questions, uh, Iman Bashir? That's up to you. Yes, sir. We can do that. Um, you, had, you had a question from Marvin Mo. Iman Bashir, can, can, how can Muhammad be a prophet of God when Torah states that all prophets come from the line of Jacob? You're going to have to tune into the, um, the next debate. Solar is going to put, it's a trilogy. So um, the next topic is something 
um, in the nature of um, has the covenant been passed to, you know, the Ishmaelites and is Muhammad, the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, the comforter. So I, I would like you to be in the building for that. Um, we, it will be coming up soon. I believe next Friday should be, you know, the date, but we got to make sure that, you know, um, our schedules are, you know, uh, feasible for that. But I, I will certainly tell you that um, I will go into the scripture of the Bible um, to actually show you these things and show you how Muhammad certainly um, was blessed, um, you know, to be a prophet through the lineage of uh, Ishmael. And, you know, Ishmael and Isaac were brothers. I mean, that's just a reality. Um, you know, Brother uh, Gorilla Hebrew stated earlier that Ish, uh, Ishmael was given a covenant. You can rewind the tape back, you know, um, as well as Isaac, you know. So um, understanding that, you know, it's, it's going to get heavy on the next, you know, next debate. So look out for that probably be next Friday on part two, you know, because we're doing three parts. And the next parts are speaking about Muhammad and the Ishmaelites. So tune into that. Okay, we got uh, Masiya Yasharala. Um, he says, Surah 2, verse 122 says, the children of Israel prefer, so why would I want to be a Muslim? And eat my best share, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, you gotta understand the, the languages. It's no question that the children of Israel um, were favored upon the creator. There's no question. Um, they definitely had that status, but they weren't, they weren't the only ones that was favored by the creator. See, that's the part. They want to make it like the, they're the only ones when other nations were, were blessed. And then when you really look into the, um, the Israelites themselves, them being so favored, them being so blessed, they continuously, time and time again, um, broke the covenant and, and new covenants had to be established. And, you know, um, this is this is the reason why Israelites will tell us today that, you know, this is why we're in captivity. This is why the white man got us like this and like that, because in the situation we're in, because, you know, we broke the covenant. So throughout the scripture, all the way to the Torah, you know, to Moses, you know, uh, Moses went up on the mount. And then when he came back, they was worshiping the golden calf. You know, um, when when. Um, Moses wanted Pharaoh to let the people go. You know, the Israelites didn't want to leave. Um, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially they told, he told Moses, like, they told Moses, like, look, you and your Lord can go ahead and handle that for us because there's giants over there in the promised land. So they was led to wander, you know, they was, you know, um, in the, in the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, etc. Actually longer than that. So you can see that, um, the, the creator always um, shows his mercy, his, 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 um, his, his grace upon the people, but you know, he also has a wrath and he also has a punishment. And so those punishments certainly were um, enacted and you know, um, and certainly the wrath had to come down and things had to change and people was lost. And so when we say Muslim, the word is essentially um, lets us understand that these are individuals that submit not, not their own will, but the will, they submit to the will of the most high creator. So all of the laws that the creator has brought forth, they um, are you know, following, and that's what we call a Muslim. So an Israelite to us is a Muslim. Anybody that is doing the will of Allah, the will of God, the, the, the will of the most high, um, they are considered to be Muslim. So, you know, it's as simple as that, but uh, I think the next debate, um, it, this more of this um, conversation will come to light. Um, and, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all Muslim that is on the path of that Surat al king, the straight path that leads to the creator. Okay, so you wanna take more questions or you wanna wrap it up? We, we could take some questions for like five more minutes. We could take a couple and then uh, we'll get out of here. Okay. Um... Uh, Micaiah L. Yazarel, he says, um, ask Bashir if the Quran was plagiarized from the book of Jasher and remix. Um, I, one, one, one is, um, and I'm not trying to, you know, be arrogant in any way, but I, I will ask you, 
for the hard work and for my elders appointing me into my status in my community, accepting me as a teacher. I'm not the teacher, I'm not the Imam, but um, please address me in that nature as Imam Bashir Abdul Ha. You know, um, I, I'm your brother Bashir, but you should give me, you know, that honor and that dignity and that respect. I'm just calling for that. So, um, you know, beloved, uh, we gotta have a conversation on the book of ja uh, Jasher. He said, "Yes, um, I don't. I don't think that will correspond with the Quran to any degree. Um, of course, there will be some things um, throughout the book of the Bible that can be seen as synonymous or very alike um, in its very nature with the scriptures, but uh, it's it's totally has a a essence of its own." Okay, uh, we have another question by Joshua Iskar. Don't don't get on me about these names. Um, it says, question for Bashir. So which book, Bible, or the Quran is better for Negroes in America and why? He actually had a debate with that same topic with um, the brother yeah. Orthodox Moore. Yeah, so, you know, um, as, as far as the, the Bible and the Quran, I would, I would say that the Quran is, um, you know, is the better uh, book for our people. And the reasons why is because, uh, one, there's so much confusion and inside the Bible as far as the law is concerned. You have people that, you know, um, and, and I agree that, um, you know, the law of the Old Testament is the standing law. Because in the New Testament, Jesus clearly says that I have not come um, to change the law, but yet I have come to fulfill the law, which means that um, obviously I have not come to change, you know, but to come to make it manifest. I've come to show you the law enacted and that it is the living law, you know, so and that law. Um, of the Old Testament, it's, it, that's why we get those phrases like, that's Old Testament, you know, that goes hard. So, you know, Islam, for example, we have homosexuality and rap, running rapid in our communities. According to Old Testament law, they will be stoned to death. You know, um, if your son is, you know, disrespectful, according to the old law in the scripture, this is real, I'm not making this up. Um, you know, your your disrespectful son should be brought in, in front of the, the elders and the people and should be stoned to death. So Islam says that the punishment should come. And, you know, um, even so, so much so that physical attacks can be there by the process of, of caning, the process of, you know, um, uh, public humiliations and, you know, um, being, you know, beat, but being beat with strikes um, that are numbered like 50 strikes, 70 strikes for adultery, 100 strikes for uh, 100 strikes for adultery, 70 for fornication, etc. So you know, just going back to the homosexual thing, um, I think that people need an opportunity to reform themselves, and you know, not to be um, murdered and bashed and killed, you know, um, by the law. Um, and uh, Islam does that. And furthermore, I think that the Quran itself is uh, better for our people because whether we want to accept it or not, the Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, um, if we're going to accept that he is truly a messenger from the Most High um, that we refer to as Allah, although he has many names um, that refer to the Most High, if we say that he is from um, the Creator, then it's, it's just us to be Muslim, to be in submission to the will of the creator and not the will of our own. So if the most high has taken us, taken us on this path and this journey to um, lead us to the Quran, then we should be obliged and obligated, we're obligated to follow that, um, that code and that path. So it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. Okay, now with that being said, we're gonna Close this thing out. Shout out to the family. Shout out to Wax Dog, uh, Brother George Mickin. Um, shout out to the Orthodox More, which will be on in the near future. That's to be announced to also to meet Iman Bashir. And um, we're going to close this thing out. Once again, if you want to be a part of this debate league, you can reach me at solarmind123 at gmail.com. Or if you want to come on and drop some knowledge, Hook up with me, solarmind123 at gmail.com. This is your boy, Solarmind. 
signing out. Peace.